Hello and welcome to episode 64 of The Garden Log with me, Ben Dark. I am a gardener and this is my gardening podcast. It is an audio diary of all the things that I have been doing and thinking in the garden this week. I am recording this at the end of a wet weekend in mid-July. It rained all day on Saturday, which bizarrely made it feel exactly like Sunday. I think it made it feel like Sunday because we also ate our first hedgerow blackberries, and we ate them in the dripping rain. And blackberries are definitely a Sunday sort of fruit. I think it's because they are, well for me at least, they are the autumnal childhood fruit. And when you're a child, as you well know, Sundays don't exist. They don't exist until September and the end of the school holidays and crumble season. I don't think anyone eats crumble in the summer holidays, do they? So anyway, blackberries mean that it's autumn, rain means it's autumn. It's obviously not. It's obviously high, high summer, but it felt like that. I should actually say, if anyone's interested in those blackberries, I found them in Dulwich Park on the edge of that jogging track that winds beneath the trees. And also in Dulwich Park, I found lots of horse chestnuts. And the horse chestnuts are looking really good this year. I don't know if anyone's noticed. They're not so leaf minored for some reason. Maybe it's just this particular outcrop. Maybe something, maybe something in the very hot summer killed them off a bit. Maybe it's just later to strike this year. But anyway, they're not looking quite as diseased as they have in past years. Perhaps Dulwich Park has done a different maintenance regime. Maybe they've sprayed. Maybe they have been sweeping the leaves and belief them assiduously to stop them staying in a gestational state down there in the soil. But anyway, they're looking really, really good. There was also this wonderful hornbeam tree, a great big spreading hornbeam tree with that pulsating trunk. You know, in America, they call hornbeams, well, some parts of America, they call them the muscle tree because they have that almost styrated, pulsating, stallion-esque, lean muscle trunk to them. And that was one of those, and it just dropped its seeds, obviously a few days before I was there. And it had done the world's worst job on seed dispersal. It dropped all of its trees exactly onto its own roots, a perfect mirror of the tree above. And you think to yourself, well, that really is not the most effective dispersal method, Mr. Hornbeam Tree. Surely you could try and and send them a little bit further. You could see all the lime trees at the moment. They've got those wonderful parachuting seeds hanging on the end of a thread beneath that that bract of leaf going whoosh. And the hornbeam hornbeam has just flopped its seeds straight onto the ground beneath it, which is probably why they they only have managed to spread from, from southeast England to southeast England in the last 5,500 years. Anyway, that amused me. Probably no one else, but but it certainly amused me. This week, I'm not talking about hornbeams on the podcast. I'm talking about the saxifraga. I'm talking about planting hedges in the heat. I'm talking about my personal summer wardrobe. So there's a crossover with those fashion podcasts that I know you, you listen to too. And I am talking about deadheading lilies. There's a lot to get through, so I suggest that we finish this introduction and get on with the week in gardening. Welcome to the Week in Gardening, a week that saw me back on home turf after seven days spent in southwest France. It was a week away that I enjoyed immensely, and a return that saw me separated from any illusion that I might have had that I was in some way indispensable. The garden looked wonderful for my absence. It looked in fine fettle, the custodians had done a fantastic job, and I am obviously not needed. There was some slight rain flattening, 
which was to be expected. I think they got a bit bombarded. The clouds pounded down with both fists upon them and all of the, the grasses that are coming into flower, particularly the steeper, was pushed flat. And I like to grow steeper quite often on the edge of paths and on the edge of patios where it can waft over and, and flow around. And when steeper gets pressed down flat onto stone by a heavy downpour, it lies there almost cemented to the ground like a like a teenager who has slathered their hair in hair gel and then pasted it exactly down the front of their nose for some reason. So that's what the steeples are looking like, but it just requires a little bit of fluffing and lifting and, and hoiking up. So anyway, that was fluff. And I did some other primping kind of jobs on Monday. You probably found yourself doing something similar if you're gardening like I am on the other side of midsummer. Things start to get tired. The Alstromera was unequivocally finished. I had left with it glowing in corners, with it leaning and flopping and cheerily waving from all the way across the garden. You could see it for miles. But I came back to see it as mere seed pods, so those got deadheaded quite nicely. And the same thing I did to the Alcamilla, the Alcamilla mollis. Alcamilla is such a fresh bright, refreshing plant until it starts to set seed and then it suddenly looks brown and it ties you to this period of summer. When you see the Alcamilla starting to crisp up, you think, oh my goodness, no, it can't be that time already. How does this year move so quickly? And so I tied it away, that, that reminder of how short the summer, how short our little lives, by, by snipping them back, by snipping all of the flowered stems back down and taking off some of the older leaves so it looks like a fresh little rosette again, like I have facelifted the plant in a desperate attempt to retain some semblance of youth. I did a similar thing to, to some other plants, that the Cicerinchium needed a real heavy going over. I've got a bed full of Cicerinchium. It's incredible in June and awful in late July. When it's up and those wonderfully tiered spikes of lemon meringue yellow are doing their thing, there's no plant better. And then suddenly the flowers are gone and the pollinators have done their business and seeds are forming and those seeds are rapidly swelling in size to the size of a shot that you might put in a BB gun. And they're turning from, from brown, slowly darker and darker towards black. And the leaves below them have gone that Cicerinchium black that only Cicerinchium leaves can really do. It goes the same black as, as pure charcoal ash. It's wonderful. I've been noticing this quite a lot this year, the different, the different tones of death in the garden, particularly seeing all of the dead box that you get in London. I cycle around a lot in London. I go through bits of Belgravia on the way home, which is, which is embassy town. And embassies like to provide a, an image that is, that is classy, dignified, classic, cool and symmetrical. So they use a lot of box. And they have vast windows in all these embassies in Belgravia. And they have many, many windows. And often they forget about a few windows high up. So you will see a, a window box with dead box in it. And dead box goes the colour of, I think the colour of like a baby sick. It's a nothing colour. It's a sick butterscotch that just looks ill. Whereas you, dead you, which I see as a reminder of my, my inability to clean up properly. I see it after I trimmed a yew hedge and you go back two weeks later to that part of the garden and you see this wonderful russet orange, this deep, almost rust colour, and you think, oh gosh, I didn't clear up my clippings. But it's a lovely colour, it's a really nice dead wood colour, I find. Anyway, Cicerinchium has this, this fantastic, magnificent black colour to the dead leaves, but they are a bit of a life suck in the garden. They don't make things look fresh and vibrant. So, so I took out the Cicerinchium, took out the flowering stems right back at the base, and once you've done that, there's very little plant left because each of the, the little growth bursts sends out leaves and a flower point and they're all connected together. So if you take them off of the ground, then essentially you've chopped the whole thing back. That might be a problem in other beds, but this one has lots of other things doing their thing. Lots of hylotelephium, the, the sedum, which is just now blushing pink and will, will take over from, from those plants that have now been felled. 
So that was Monday. It was a day of freshening, of primping, of trying to force back the months, of trying to pretend that the year is not racing towards its end. On Tuesday, the heat carried on building. Monday had been regulation, summer hot. Tuesday was almost worth commenting to cashiers hot. Worth having a little chat with the person next to you in the line to buy their pint of milk and saying, goodness, isn't it hot? And so I changed into my summer outfit. My summer outfit consists of long-sleeved shirts, which you can roll down to your cuffs to, to leave less forearm exposed. It has a collar that you can turn up to avoid the tender back of the neck. And I also wear an oversized leather Stetson because once you have your collar turned up and your sleeves flapping around, then it makes sense to just look completely risible and protect yourself from the sun. So I, so I got on that outfit and went off to the meadow. It's nice, the meadow, actually. It's not particularly colourful at the moment. It is wonderfully grass-heady. There's quite a lot of napweed in there, in fact a vast amount of napweed. But napweed isn't a plant that shouts from a distance for some reason. It has a magnificent habit of looking wonderful up close. You go and see it and you think, my goodness, this is glorious. A field full of this would look really quite something. And then you get a field full of it and it doesn't look quite something somehow. It seems to, to lose itself amongst the grass no matter how much there is of it. But I still, I still enjoy having it in the meadow. The, the other big performer at the moment is the wild carrot, which makes sense when I'm wearing my, my Stetson and my long sleeved shirt that this should be out because it is the plant of heat and high summer. It's the plant I associate with Aegean hillsides and tough scraggly Greek goats. And in the meadow it is covered, absolutely covered in pollinators. And the best sort of pollinators, not the bees that everyone loves, everyone loves a bee and we know that they're in danger and we've got so many bee fan club members but the, the wild carrot attracts flies, vast amounts of flies, which I think is because of the, the little spot in the centre, I think that's what it's for I talked about this last year I think but I'm certain that little dot in the middle of the umbilifer, the little drop of Queen Anne's blood, is there to act as a suggestive matable fly for other flies and it attracts proper flies and it attracts hover flies and it attracts beetles, beetles of all sorts, mainly red soldier beetles at the moment. Those quite exciting flying, very long red beetles that spend all of their time copulating. I don't think there's a species that spends more time in the act of generation than, than these things. It was quite nice to see them all at their business across the meadow. Also hoverflies, amorous hoverflies would, would land upon the wild carrot that I was studying and, and the lower member of the, the partnership would have a little, little feed, either on the nectar or the, the pollen. I know that the, the soldier beetles are definitely eating the pollen, but the, the hoverflies, they might be taking some nectar while, while in, in the midst of, of things. And um, yes, that's really nice to see. Soldier beetles, by the way, are very good things to have in the garden because because the grubs like to, to grub about in long grass and I think they they eat small tiny sluglets sluglets that will one day go on to cause damage are, are snaffled up before they can become tyrants so, so it's wonderful to see those it's very it's very nice there are more carrots in this year undoubtedly than last year and I'd like to say that that's because of our diligent management. It's now coming into the third full year under our care, the programme of maximising biodiversity in the meadow by doing our hay cuts and sowing our yellow rattle. But it's probably because, because wild carrots are biennial plants. So we're just seeing the results of last year's baking summer coming through now. Either way, I'm very happy about it. On Wednesday, I did some planting. I started out with some nice penstemon, penstemon Evelyn or Evelyn, depending on your, your want. And it's a lovely penstemon. It's one of the, the small penstemon, but it's small rather than dwarf. It's not a, a stunted plant with full-sized flowers, which looks faintly comic and, and absurd. It is a plant that is dainty, petite in all its parts. 
and it has very neat leaves and lovely almost purple tinged stems so actually if you blend it between light grasses it looks good even without the flowers but the flowers are delicious they are they are small classic penstemon tubes but in a lovely blush pink and the advantage of this this small light penstemon is that it doesn't have that penstemon habit of pulling itself apart that some of the bigger varieties do. This is what you find with, with plants like Alcimira as well, that they tend to grow up and then decide to go out completely, drag themselves flat and generally behave like utter nightmares. So I put a lot of that with its, with its lovely wine-toned foliage and stems in amongst some grass on the edge of some beds. It just adds a little bit of light and, and levity to that area of the garden. I also planted another 80 London Pride, another 80 Saxifraga cross herbium, which I think now is, is becoming my plant of the year. I think unless we get a serious challenger in the next few weeks, it is going to be the plant of 2019 for me, which is a revelation because I'd overlooked it for so long. I've known about it forever and I've always just brushed past it and now I'm in love. It's one of those brilliant tales, a, a hope for, for plain Janes everywhere across the world. Maybe one day the gardener-in-chief will realise that why has he been lusting for those, those fickle penstemon? His true plant was here all along. Anyway, the plants were in nine centimetre pots, which is just too small for planting with a spade. I was putting them in into the edges of some, some shady rock cascade bits where they'll do very well in, in filling themselves out, shaping themselves to the, the crevices and the cracks. And I couldn't use a spade, so I had to use the old, the old trowel, which means that I have this blister in the center of my palm, a blister about the size of a watch battery, something I normally only get in bulb planting season. So I have the hands of an October man in mid-July. It's strange, strange business. Anyway, that will heal and the saxifrage will look absolutely perfect. On Thursday, I came in. And normally I do research for the garden masters on Thursday, but on Thursday I, I came in because there's various, various reasons. And it was hot. The temperature was, was wavering upwards towards not the hottest day of the year, but the hottest day ever recorded in England. Will we make it? Won't we make it? And while while the meteorologists search desperately for, for temperature gauges in Basildon and Heathrow, I collected a dispiriting collection of iron. I collected a trenching shovel, a mattock, a wrecking bar and a pickaxe which did not bode well. It boded a day of heavy, heavy digging. I had a delivery of ewes to, to fill in some gaps and plant a newly created section of hedge, which is the worst possible job, the worst possible plant, the worst possible day. The sun was absolutely liquidating. You know, people say it was beating down, it was blistering, it was a blasting heat. This didn't feel that kind of heat. It didn't feel like a kind of radiation, shred your skin off heat. It felt like the sun was cooling all of the, the moisture out of the ground to come and hang around in the humid air. It felt like it was blood temperature and blood viscosity. I felt like I was walking and talking and digging and drinking my tea inside somebody's veins. And it was inescapable, inescapable in every position in the garden, in the shade, in the sun, on the hills. There was nowhere that you could go to avoid this suffocating pad of wet air. I was wearing this cobalt blue shirt, long sleeve of course, collar up. And by lunchtime, I had sort of patterned it with all these isobars of crystallised white salt. And I had tide lines, actual tide lines, across my, my biceps because my shoulders obviously had been sweating a lot and my elbows had been sweating not at all. It was a miserable, miserable day. But I dug that channel and got those ewes in, got them firmed in and got the sprinkler on them to so hope that they bed in there. A lesson, a lesson in forward planning. You should get all of your planting done, you gardeners out there in the spring or in the autumn. 
because not only is it better for the plant, it is better for the gardener. Though anyone who has ever gardened on a large scale will know that sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes one needs to use the hottest day ever to do the hardest task ever. So I went home on Thursday well and truly tired and ready to come back again for the last day of the week. And on Friday, blessed relief, the temperature had dropped. I realised that I hadn't finished planting the hedge after all. There were still ewes to go. But somehow the ground was softer, the spade was heavier in my hand, able to cleave through lumps of chalk and flint without a problem. Things that had taken me two hours yesterday took me 20 minutes on the Friday. And I was able to, to knock out the few last ewes in no time at all. I realised that we really should have more flexibility in our lives and our working week. It would have been lovely to be able to say, well, actually, I'll take the whole of Thursday off. It's dangerous. It's damaging. But um, anyway, we came in, came in, got, got the thing done on Friday and then carried on with more regulation tasks. I did some deadheading of the lilies. Lily deadheading is one of those jobs. Some people like to do it as they go. So as each trumpet starts to fade, they would twist it off so that it spends not a single calorie of its energy in setting seed. All of the energy goes straight back into the bulb. I don't have time for any of that nonsense, so I wait until each spike has completely finished flowering and then chop the whole lot off in one go, just above a pair of leaves lower down the stem. And it actually made the garden look quite a lot better because I chopped fairly low because a lot of those lily stems had dried lily petals clinging to them from the from the rainstorms that I mentioned earlier in this segment and that had knocked off petals which had then dried upon the stem looking like some sort of sewer had burst its banks and, and deposited tissue paper across a section of pavement and then gone away and, and dried out and so having those away left left the garden looking fresher again once more it seems that in this time of year i'm doing everything i can to just freshen things to to re-green revivify the areas and chopping those off helped quite a little bit so i did some of that and then rushed around doing sundry cleaning tasks there were going to be lots of people in the garden over the weekends so i made sure that hoses were stowed neatly and that the wheelbarrows were arranged in geometrically pleasing shapes in case we have anyone around who cares about that sort of thing. Goodness, I hope not. I hope there are better things to care about, but you never know what is going to float someone's boat. And that was it, the end of the week. I went home and was very relieved to be there. So with all gardening having finished, let's see if I have any recommendations this week. My recommendation this week is about seeing things in a new light. Something that is important, whether you're talking about gardens or people or cherished ideas. I am the host of a gardening podcast, so I'm talking about gardens in a new light. Surprise, surprise. I won't talk about people in a new light. You don't want you don't want purient gossip on this podcast. So I stayed late on Wednesday night. That's the day you might remember that I was planting all of that London pride and giving myself blisters. I stayed late for various reasons. There was lots of work to be done and I got the impression that I was falling behind and I wanted to catch up a little bit. And it was very enjoyable. I worked late, but I didn't work massively, massively all out hard. Somehow, when everyone else has gone home, you, you work in a different way. You work in a contented, methodical way that is almost like you're working in your own garden. And it was really nice to see the garden in literally a different light. I've noticed that on this podcast, I am always denigrating midsummer. I denigrate midsummer and I eulogize autumn and spring. And I think that my main complaint about midsummer is about the light. I think that I find it harsh and uncompromising and I think it lacks romance 
because it highlights the blemishes and gives us no softness and nowhere to hide. But on Wednesday, as I worked late, I was able to see the shade of the trees slowly creeping out across the garden. And as I was there, the, the glare, that white glare, softened. It's like softening from a, a lard sort of white to a clarified butter, sort of ghee-like gold and yellow. And I was reminded that summer doesn't wash things out. It's just that in the summer, I never see the garden that I work in as it is letting go of dawn or approaching dusk. And I do in spring and autumn. And that's what I, what I miss. And it was really useful to see where the light falls and what bits of the garden are illuminated on a summer's evening as opposed to, to an autumn evening or a winter's evening. It's very useful as a professional gardener to know this looks good there and that doesn't. And I should have done this in the last couple of years, in the last few summers I've been in the garden, but it was very nice to, to notice what is looking good at that time, which shrub finds itself gloriously and suddenly illuminated by beams that would never touch it in even September, even in late August, and know that it is serving a purpose that I had not even even thought of for it. That was really, really enlightening. And my recommendation here is not for those of you who are in your own gardens, who know it from the moment it wakes until the moment it, it passes out under the midnight sky. This recommendation is for the professional gardeners among you. And I know there are professional gardeners. I get messages from them. I know that there are people here who, who work in large estates or who work for, for customers in towns and, and cities and I would just say try to get there occasionally in the evenings try to stay late or visit your clients or if they're not in just try to just try to arrange a time where you can go and see the garden as they would see it when they were hosting or entertaining or taking a gin and tonic in their grounds because it will give you a different view of the place it would give you ideas and it would show things that might need to be changed or or withheld or added to maybe you realize that in an evening everything is is lost from that part of the garden because it's shaded by by that cedar and maybe you need some white plants out there some some white roses to to shine in the gloom and the, the the purple is that you thought lovely there that you thought looked great because you're only there between seven in the morning and, and four in the afternoon and you realize that actually those purples have gone you can't see them they need something else there so that's my recommendation go out there and stay until until nine o'clock and chalk it up to time in loo don't come in the next day take 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 the next week off do whatever you need to but um but try to see the place from a different view I think I'm going to try and, and do some other experiments like that. Maybe I'll come in wearing green goggles so I can't see any colour at all, just see textures and forms. Or come in blindfolded so that I can just smell and hear. Or well, I don't know. Anyway, it's, it's an idea. Take yourself out, view the garden from another angle, view the garden another time of day, view the garden in, in another mood, in another mindset, and you might have some, some good ideas to implement. Anyway, no other recommendations this week, I'm afraid. If you have a recommendation or something you'd like mentioned on the podcast, then please do feel free to, to email me. If there's something going on or you've done something, you've published a book, you have just written the world's greatest poem about Japanese and enemies, then be sure to let me know. You can reach me at thegardenlogpodcast at gmail.com. Let me know if there is anything that might benefit from a mention in this section. If not, then you may continue quite happily to listen in silence and I will speak to you again this time next week when we have episode 65 of The Garden Log. Thank you very much and goodbye. Mm -hmm.